So today we're going to look at uh, security protocols and it turns out that it's actually not that easy um, and there can be interesting ways in which to attack them. A while ago I was talking about RSA, which is a well-known example of public key cryptography. Public key cryptography, also known as asymmetric cryptography, is a little bit like having a, a little padlock. We have two parts. We have the public key and we have the private key. And we generate those together. That's what we saw in the RSA video. And then the idea is that we can use the public key to lock something, which I'm going to have an analogy. We're going to lock this envelope. Now the envelope is locked. Now, of course, for a physical envelope, you can just tear it or open it another way. But we're going to, you know, keep the analogy. Uh, so nobody can open this lock except for one person, which is the person who created the lock, who has the private key, this little key here. Um, so the owner of that can now open the message using their key by opening the lock and taking it out, right? But in order to do the encryption, because this is private key cryptography, you could have done this yourself. You don't need my key to lock the message. You only need my key to unlock the message. Okay. So if I, for instance, write a secret on here, is this what we're saying? Yep. you haven't seen and then I put it into the envelope mm -hmm. and then you know, the point is that I can lock this without having the key right that's right so I don't need the key to lock it it's locked and then I can hand it back to you right so you just send me a message which nobody else can read but me because the only way to read it is to open this little lock and there's only one key in the world that can open it and I've never given this key to anyone else. So I can now open the envelope and read your message. And it all works exactly as intended, right? You can use this to send a secret message to me. But now the problem is, how do we know that the person that has a key is actually the person that we want to talk to? So let's say that you want to know who I am, right? I claim that I am Bob, but you want me to prove this to you. So what we can do is we can use the same trick. You obtain my public key because it's public. Anyone can get the public key belonging to Bob, right? And you do exactly what you did before. You come up with a secret, you encrypt it with that, you put it in the envelope, and I'm the only one that can open it. So at that stage, I've just opened it, just like before. I read your message, and all I do is give you back the message, and you read it, yeah. and you're like, right, this guy must have this key, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to read the message. So I'm using the fact that I can read the message as evidence to you that I am Bob, I am the holder of this private key. And we did it here over the table, but in reality, you might want to do it over post, right? And this is the design challenge of the internet. So it's a term that many of you will have heard of in some way or another. It's called a man in the middle. If I send you a message over the internet, um, it isn't just going to pass through my computer and your computer. It will actually pass through various servers all around the world, routers, network devices. Um, so we, do, we don't trust them. They can potentially read our messages um, and, and try to play around with that. And in this analogy, uh, that rule will be taken by the post, right? You're going to post the envelope to me and I'm going to receive it by post. Okay, so we have our uh, post box here. I'm going to put my same secret in there. I'm going to lock it with your public key. Once I've done that, I'm going to pop that in the post box. And then at some point or another, Pat the postman will be emptying the mailbox, the letterbox, and he'll get access to the locked letter. And if they're doing their job well, they'll deliver it to me and I will open the letter.
So I know the secret is 42. And I'll give the secret back to the mail. And then the postman will deliver the letter. So let's pretend that Pat the postman is malicious. They're trying to pretend that they are me. They're trying to pretend to be Bob. So they want to convince you, Alice, that they have possession of this key and thereby being able to pretend there's someone they're not. So if you post this letter... This is back to where we were with my secret in a letter with your, lot with your public... Yeah. Gone back in the post, yeah. And we just established that there's only one person that can open the letter and that is the person with this key. So if Pat the postman is able to open this letter for you, you would be convinced that they have this key, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you just gave the letter to Pat and challenged him to open the letter. But what Pat does is he doesn't try to open the letter, he just gives the letter to me. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm challenged to open a letter. So I open it and say to Pat, you see, I can open it, here you go. And next step is Pat delivers the letter back to you. Ah, so as far as I'm concerned, Pat's just given me that number. Correct. So that means Pat must have had possession of this key from your point of view. So you're now convinced that Pat is Bob. Pat and Bob are the same person, uh, which is obviously not the case, right? So Pat has now successfully broken this very simple protocol. Now, this sort of attack is known, has been known for a long time. Um, and of course, all the protocols are, are a lot smarter than that. But these are the challenging things that you need to face when designing a protocol. You can't make these simple assumptions that just because someone is able to decrypt something, it means that they must have the key. No, they might be able to use tricks. So you want to design your protocol to make sure that these tricks do not exist. The protocol that we're going to be looking at is the Needham Schroeder public key protocol. Um, because it's a public key protocol, the very first step is that everyone involved generates a public key and a private key. So as before, we have my private key and my public key. I give my public key to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And similarly, you have a private key and a public key. And you give your public key to me. Now, the goal of that protocol is for us to exchange secrets so that we're both convinced that we're talking to each other and we know each other's secret. Now, knowing each other's secrets is useful because we can then use that as a later basis to come up with a so-called symmetric key. That's typically how it's done. Um, and we need to be wary of Pat the Postman playing around. So, in the Needham Schroeder protocol, uh, the first step will be that Alice will create a secret like before, um, but also she will write down her identity on a piece of paper. Now, this will make sure that if I, Bob, receive the closed envelope, I will know not only the secret, but also the person that was challenging me to open the envelope, which in this case is Alice. So please write down your identity on a piece of paper. Alice, and I have my secret from before, which I'm going to reuse. Envelope, and I put in my secret and my name. And then I use Bob's public key to lock the envelope. Because I don't need the key, I can just push it shut. And then, am I sending this via the post then? You are, yes. Okay, so then posting that. Okay, and then, uh, yeah. thank you Pat for delivering Alice's message. I see an envelope here, I wonder who that could be. And I'm able to open it because it was encrypted with my public key. There we go. Let me have a look. Ah, we have a secret number, 42. And we have the name of the person who's challenging me, Alice. So now I know that Alice is trying to talk to me and that she came up with the secret 42. Now to prove that I have this key, 
I need to prove that I know the number 42. So I'm going to send you back the number 42. This is to prove that I was able to read the message. And I'm going to write down a secret of myself. I'm going to pick a number which is easy to write, read upside down. 69. And I'm going to put this in an envelope. And in order to make sure that Pat the Postman can't pretend to be someone they're not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock it using your public key, Alice's public key. Do you not have to put your name on it or is that? I am not putting my name on it. That's a good observation that it will actually turn out to be very important. Okay. And I'm putting this back to Pat the Postman mm -hmm. and giving it back to you. Okay. So, I'm opening it up, got my post, Let's put my camera down again, and I've got my private key here, with my A on it, so I am going to unlock it. So I have 42, and 69. So I think I'm satisfied that my uh, message has got to you and come back again. Yeah, so you know that it must have gotten eventually to the person holding this key and you now also have the number 69. So that means that you not only know that it was me that must have read it at some point, you also know the pair of the secret numbers 42 and 69 and so do I. But I don't know yet that I'm talking to you. So you need to now prove that you are who you say you are mm -hmm. by showing that you were able to open your lock. Now, what would be the solution for that? I guess I send you your number back. Right? You just send me my number back. That's exactly right. Okay. So can you, 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 you can use my public key for that. Okay, so do you need anything else in here or just No, just, just a 69. Okay, so 69 goes in there. And it gets locked with your public key and posted in the post box and sent to you. Thank you very much. Let's have a look whether the person who claimed to be Alice in the beginning is actually Alice or not. Sixty-nine. They must be. Great. So now we're both convinced that we have been talking to each other. So you know you've been talking to Bob. I know I've been talking to Alice. We both know the secret numbers 69 and 42. And nobody else in the world knows that combination of numbers. These are very rare numbers that you almost never find. Um, and what we can do is we can, for example, create a so-called symmetric key out of these two numbers. Uh, of course, these numbers in computers would be way larger and you can use that to, to do crypto more efficiently and we can communicate to each other more quickly using this new key. We don't have to fiddle around with these public keys anymore. Um, because just as it was a little bit clumsy for us, it's also a little bit clumsy for computers to use um, asymmetric encryption. Okay, so that's all great. Um, but what I said is that these protocols are often not as secure as you might think. Now, the interesting thing was that there was actually a proof that this protocol was secure. And it kind of is. Because if you're planning to talk to me, and I'm planning to talk to you, and we do this whole setup, there's no possibility for Pat the Postman to interfere. There's nothing he could have done to make us miscommunicate and use different numbers or find out what the numbers is or confuse who we're talking to. But there are some scenarios that were not considered back then where actually there is an attack. So if we rewind all the way to the beginning and like before, instead of talking to me, you want to talk to Pat the Postman. Okay, so what would you do if you wanted to talk to Pat the Postman? Uh, I'd send him a secret and my name. You would send him a secret and your name and you would close the envelope with what? With his public key. With his public key. Why would I want to talk to Pat? 
Well, in the case of the postal office, there might not really be a scenario. But if you think about the internet, there could be a scenario like that. For example, let's say that you go to a, a dodgy website, right? Now your computer will still want to set up a secure connection to that dodgy website. So you want to talk to the dodgy website. But then the dodgy website could, like Pat, use that connection to set up a fake connection behind the scenes. So if you're surfing to a dodgy website, this attack could apply. Fortunately, of course, um, modern protocols do not have this problem. So it's okay for you to go to dodgy websites. <laughs> Don't sue me. Right, so you're sending your secret and your identity to Pat. Into my envelope. And then we're using Pat's public key. in the post box and you are now expecting a reply from pat so what you're expecting pat to do is to open the message with their public key so i'm just going to pretend to be pat for a second uh, just to make this work right so we're using pat's um, private key to open the lock so pat has opened the message that was addressed to them. And Pat reads that Alice wants to share the secret 42 and set up a connection with them. Right, so their job is to now come up with a secret of their own. But instead of doing that, what Pat does is they actually put this back into a box. Alice and 42 Close the envelope and lock it with Bob's public key. And then delivers the letter to Bob. Okay, so from Bob's perspective, they just got a request and they're just opening it. They don't know at this stage whether it came from Pat or from Alice. They just know that they got a message. And then I, Bob, is reading this and says, oh, Alice wants to talk to me, and their secret is 42. Okay, fair enough. And I do my part of the protocol. I take 42 to prove to Alice that I am who I say I am, and I create my own number, uh, 69, and I'm putting them in the envelope and giving it back to Pat. So I'm using Alice's key here, To lock the message. So because you know it's going to Alice, you lock it with Alice's key. Exactly. Uh, it's just the name that I found on this piece of paper here. And I'm giving this back to Pat. Now at this stage, you're expecting a response from Pat. Oh, yeah. And that response is two random numbers. The random number that you gave to Pat, which is 42, to prove that Pat has access to their public key. And another random number, which is generated by Pat, right? Unlock this, because that's my private key. There we go. I'll open up the public key. And in here, I'll find my 42 that I sent, and then a private number 69, okay. So that means that the person you were talking to is? Well, that must be from Pat, who I sent it to, right? That's right, because they just proved to you that they know it's 42. Yeah. But what is your response to Pat? Oh, okay. Because Pat them. also doesn't know whether they're talking to you. I need to send back the new number, 69, not my secret. And then I need to lock it with Pat's public key and then put that back in the post, right? Yep. So then Pat receives the message addressed to Pat. So Pat will use their private key to open it and they can see your response, which is 69. So now Pat knows both the secret 69 and 42, uh, but it's not done yet because Pat also wants to lure me into believing that Pat is Alice, right? That was the whole point. 
So basically the protocol between Alice and Pat has now finished and Alice and Pat know that they're talking to each other and there's no problem with that part of it. But in the very final thing that happens is that Pat encrypts the message with Bob's public key. Okay, so we have the message encrypted with Bob's key and Pat gives this message to Bob, to me, and I'm using my private key to open it. I open the message and I see my own secret being sent back to me. Now clearly that must mean that I was talking to Alice because from my perspective I got Alice and 42 and then I sent the message back to Alice with 42 and my secret 69 um, and then only the person that had the key was able to decrypt that and send it back to me. So I must have been talking to Alice. And so I believe that I'm talking to Alice, but I'm really talking to Pat. You believe you're talking to Pat and that is correct. But that means that if Pat is a dodgy website and I am an online bank and you're a customer, right? You'd be logging into a dodgy website and then the dodgy website is using that connection to pretend to be Alice for that connection. So they can then do all kinds of bad things and I will believe that it is not Pat, the malicious postman, but Alice, my customer, who is doing those things. And that is of course very bad. The reason why this was overlooked for, for over a decade was because it's quite subtle, because you wouldn't expect initially that Alice would want to talk to Pat. So it was really focused on the possibility of just Alice wanting to talk to Bob and Bob wanting to talk to Alice. Can anything go wrong then? The answer was no, so everyone was happy. But then it turned out that this scenario exists and that's bad. Now, is there an easy way to fix this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I stumbled upon it actually earlier. You should really have sent me your name back. Yes, all I needed to do was in the stage, um, in the stage where I was sending uh, 42 and 69, if I had added another message saying Bob at my stage and just put that together with the two values in the envelope and sent it back with Alice's public key. Then I give this back to Pat. Now Pat isn't able to open this message. All they did was forward this message to you and then you opened it and you saw 42 and 69. Now, if you open the envelope, what would you see? Alice's key. Now we know that Bob sent this from the thing I sent to him, and here's a new secret. Yes, because you would be like, hold on a second, I was trying to talk to Pat, not to Bob. Why does this say Bob? And you'd know that something was amiss, and you'd abort the protocol, and the attack would fail. Now, this is academic and this, this attack has been known now for decades. Um, but unfortunately, attacks like it are likely to exist occasionally uh, because it's really, really difficult to think about all the ways in which you can combine protocols and protocol runs together. And the attacker only needs to find one way to break it and the protocol is broken. And if you're on the defensive side and you want to make sure that your protocol is secure, you need to think about all the possible ways in which the protocols can be overlapping or interfering with each other. And you have to show that it's always going to be safe. And that's the difficulty. Or in front of it. So the belief would be updated to say that I'm probably here, here, or and here. I raise it to the 29th power, so I multiply it with itself 29 times on the clock, and the number I end up with 